earlier, I spoke to Jean-Pascal Van Ypercelle, who's a professor of climatology and environmental sciences at the Catholic University of Louvain. I've been working on climate change for the last 40 years now, and I am increasingly worried because the, the situation is becoming uh, really serious and policymakers and citizens don't realize the severity of the situation. I mean, the, uh, so some parts of the planet are going to be uninhabitable, that simply. It's as simple as that. And um, I think few people realize that. So uh, we really need to achieve the, um, the goals of the Paris Agreement. We really need to maintain the temperature uh, warming the, below 1.5 degrees C. We have warmed that temperature by 1.2 degrees C already. And you see with 1.2 what's happening. Uh, you, you've been talking about what's happening in North America. Few people talk about what's happening in Pakistan. It's 52. It was 52 degrees C a few days ago. So this is these are killing temperatures. 500 people have died in, in Canada and probably hundreds, if not more, in, in Pakistan as well, even if the statistics are, will probably not be available for a long time. So really, the, the, it, it's urgent uh, to take this uh, climate problem much more seriously and to leave fossil fuel in the ground uh, as much as possible. As you say, the statistics won't be available for a while. So how much of what we're seeing in Western Canada, and I suppose in Pakistan as well, how much of that is actually man-made? Well, you know, the question should actually now become the, the opposite. What, which climate extremes wouldn't be these days linked to climate change. You know, climate is, as, as my um, former um, uh, climate, uh, climatologist, uh, the late Steve Snyder state, climate is on steroids with, with uh, the um, greenhouse gases that we are injecting in the atmosphere. So the number of extremes in terms of temperature, intense precipitation, etc., can only increase. And uh, we really need to take this much more seriously than, than, than we are. Uh, and some most extremes uh, are now, uh, most climate extremes are indeed related uh, to this uh, global warming. Most people don't think about heat as a killer, and it is. And we know that the numbers are fairly high. Certainly, the event we've seen, we're going to see excess deaths a lot more than we should have because all of those deaths could have been prevented. So we have to raise that awareness. heard about lit in British Columbia, uh, which burned almost essentially to the ground. Uh, and there's been multiple fatalities reported there and, and other people not accounted for. Some people are having to go two to three hours away just to get uh, check in with emergency social services. Uh, so this is something that we've never seen before in this province or really in this country anywhere. It was a perfect tinderbox. Firefighters are struggling to contain more than a hundred forest fires in British Columbia after a combination of record temperatures, lightning strikes and high winds created deadly conditions. 
Canada's Prime Minister says climate change is to blame. Today our thoughts are mostly with uh, families that are grieving, that are uh, facing terrible loss. Uh, but of course, uh, we also have to reflect on the fact that extreme weather events are getting more frequent. And climate change has a significant role to play in that. The blazes are expected to burn through over 100,000 hectares by the end of the weekend. Around 1,000 people have had to be evacuated after fires destroyed 90% of the town of Leighton. This a day after it set a record high temperature, with a thermometer hitting 49.6 degrees Celsius, or 121 degrees Fahrenheit. More than 700 heat-related deaths have been reported due to the extreme conditions. Meanwhile, in parts of Northern California, evacuation notices have been issued due to a fire that's been raging for more than a week. The state was hit by some of the worst wildfires in its history last year. It's currently going through a historic drought. Residents worry further outbreaks are likely this summer. We're going to cross then to uh, Vancouver, speak to our correspondent Craig McCulloch, who joins us from there. Craig, I mean, the story of Lytton really seems to be um, representing in a way, doesn't it, the fears of uh, so many there. It does indeed. It was the hottest three days in Canadian history. No other day has been as hot as it was in Lytton and the surrounding area for the past three days. So the ground, uh, the, the brush there, uh, any plant life is the driest it has ever been in history. Um, and the evacuation order came down. There was absolutely no time for anybody to do anything. They had to get out as fast as they possibly could. There's three ways in and out of Lytton. So people just scrambled, families got split up, pets were unfortunately left behind. And 90% of that town, which is a population of about 250, the surrounding area is about a thousand. And they use Lytton kind of as the hub to get their mail, to get their groceries and whatnot. They're all spread out everywhere. Um, and they had no time to get there. Um, what's left behind is, as I said, 90% has been burned down. The police station uh, has been torched. The ambulance station and the medical facilities have been burned. Most of the homes have been uh, burned to the ground, uh, as has the telecommunications infrastructure, which makes it incredibly hard uh, to do any search and rescue and for media to actually get in there because once they're there there's pretty much no way that they can either get power or get the signal out and a lot of people are saying that the, this is a sign and this is what global warming is all about. Yeah as you mentioned there uh, Craig at the top it's not just Lytton is it I mean the whole area has really been suffering over the the last week. Indeed, and you're showing some pictures right now of what it is like uh, to be in that area, uh, to what it's like to drive uh, uh, to drive through these flames. Um, and right now, there's 106 forest fires, and I just looked this up just a few moments ago, uh, burning in British Columbia. And we right now, are, well, we are always the most western province uh, in Canada. We're just north of Washington State. Uh, 84 of those 106 forest fires, wildfires currently burning in British Columbia have been reported just in the last two days. And normally we get, we do get forest fires in July and August, but we normally don't get them at the end of June and beginning of July. Ironically, it's still July 1st here in British Columbia, it's Canada Day. It, this is really uncommon to get these type of fires with such intensity. And as such, there's evacuations happening all across British Columbia, um, which is again, still very dry. The temperatures are cooling down somewhat. It's in the mid twenties right here in the Vancouver area, 26. Uh, just before we went to Air Stewart, it's 34 degrees Celsius uh, up in Lytton, and that's gonna hold until the weekend. And then the temperature is supposed to go down into the high twenties. Same for all the other air areas are being evacuated. And there's no sign of rain. Ironically, these fires can actually produce their own weather systems. Now, that's a mixed blessing because, yes, there's rain, but also with rain and these hot temperatures come thunderstorms and lightning, which actually creates more forest fires or actually makes the fires that are currently underway even worse. So it's a mixed blessing, and it doesn't look like it's going to ease up anytime soon. Filipino fishermen here say these are their most trying times. Danny Marasigan is worried about his future. It's really sad. If the volcano explodes again, where do we go? There are no jobs anywhere anymore. 
Last year's volcanic eruption, coupled by the coronavirus pandemic, have almost decimated the fishing industry here in Agoncillo municipality, south of the capital Manila. It had been showing signs of recovery over the past few months. But last Thursday's volcanic activity is threatening livelihoods once again. People here say they are grateful they are able to work. Many of them had to borrow money to start over again, and they remain deep in debt. They say they can't afford another closure. The Ta'al volcano spewed toxic black plumes on Thursday afternoon, prompting the local government to move people living within the seven-kilometer danger zone. More than 14,000 have been taken to temporary shelters, many of whom are dependent on fishing for their livelihood. An hour away in Talisay, a popular tourist destination, Casilda Guevara is doing all she can to keep her three-year-old cafe the, afloat. see that foaming? We were really in the red. It's been tough. What keeps me going, I have a responsibility to my staff. And also, I just like to cook. I, like, I just like to, to serve people. Many businesses here have closed, but there are those who remain defiant and hopeful that better days will come once again. Jamela Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Talisay, Batangas Province, Northern Philippines. As Storm Elsa makes its way towards Florida, authorities are racing against time to demolish what's left of Chaplin Tower South. Around half of the building is still standing, but officials fear that if the frail structure were to give way, debris could cover potential survivors and endanger rescue teams. An order to bring down the remains has been signed by the county mayor. Search and rescue does, does have to pause temporarily while the demolition preparation is underway. And that uh, there is threat to the standing building that is posed to the first responders, as we've told you. So preparation includes activities like drilling into columns in the unsafe structure. Another two bodies were found on Saturday, bringing the death toll to 24. Roughly 120 people are still missing, feared dead. No survivors have been retrieved from the rubble since the first few hours after the 40-year-old building partially collapsed on the 24th of June. Officials still haven't determined what caused the building to collapse, but a 2018 engineering report found structural deficiencies that investigators are now focusing on. It became like a mini American city, 75 kilometers from Kabul. It was the starting point for many Americans deployed to Afghanistan, and for almost 2,000 servicemen and women killed in action, Bagram Air Base was where they began the final journey home. Hello, Bagram! It was visited by Presidents Bush, Obama, Trump, well, and now it's much. been handed over to the Afghans. The final troops and equipment airlifted out, the US still on target for a full withdrawal by September 11th, 2021. We're on track exactly as to where we expect it to be. But we just, I wanted to make sure there was enough, quote, running room that we could get, wouldn't be able to do it all to September. There'll still be some four forces left, but it's a rational drawdown with our allies and it's making, uh, so there's no, nothing uh, unusual about it. The U.S. plans to leave 650 troops in Afghanistan to protect the embassy and diplomatic missions with capacity to help Afghan security forces if required. The repeating line, the U.S. is not abandoning Afghanistan. We have a robust uh, footprint uh, in the region, uh, even outside Afghanistan, and we still have the capability uh, to conduct over-the-horizon missions as necessary uh, for counterterrorism. In Afghanistan itself, thousands are hoping to leave the country ahead of the final U.S. withdrawal. The lines for exit visas and passports are long. People worried a resurgent Taliban could sweep to power. It's already making military gains. What we're seeing is the... Uh you know, rapid loss of, of district centers, although the Afghan security forces have actually gained some of those back in uh, certain parts of the country. The withdrawal from Bagram Air Base is significant and symbolic. It was the center of U.S. military power in Afghanistan. Now, the White House says it will continue to monitor the security situation, and if it sees a threat to the United States, it will act immediately. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera, at the White House.
I find this notion that the Taliban provides some insurance against civil war to be so risible, I'm, I'm unable to politely comment upon it. The Taliban are the source of the problem. Um, this, And I, I also want to speak a little bit about the justice issue. This idea that the Taliban have prov- have been providing justice, this is, I mean, this has been sort of like the, the standard pablum talking points now for the for most of this conflict. But you know what? There's actually no evidence for it. I mean, there have been discussions about the Taliban uh, mobile uh, justice vehicles that come in. They're sort of like um, roving Sharia courts. These are rumors. There's not a lot of evidence for it. Well, what me, we me, do have – l- well, let me finish, sir. I, I've actually listened, listened very patiently to, to, the, sure. to the absurdities of others. Um, what seems to be the Taliban's bailiwick – incidentally, we also see this in Pakistan – they're not solving complicated cases. They, they're they solving cases that are relatively simple. Um, for example, if someone runs uh, doesn't have an arranged marriage or if someone runs off with another person's daughter, um, if someone uh, accidentally kills a piece of livestock or a tree falls on someone's houses, these are the kinds of cases that the Taliban are resolving. And for a lot of rural Afghans, that's actually enough. But you really have to understand, in some cases, the brutality with which these cases are resolved. So if a boy runs off with another family's girl, the, the Taliban may issue a judgment that that girl's family's men get to go and rape the, the women of the offending boy's household, right? So let's I, – I really – when we talk about – this justice fetish that so many Western analysts have with the Taliban without a lot of ground experience or, quite frankly, evidence, this, I think, really creates an illusion that the Taliban want us to create on its behalf. This is, this is I will say, um, it's a story. There's not a lot of evidence for it. And I've, I've been going to Afghanistan now for well over a decade. Um, what What people will say is that uh, what the the U.S. has brought is freedoms without security. And what they got under the Taliban was predictable security. But without, this isn't a choice. Uh, yes, right? Security without freedom. And I think when you're just talking about your kids going out, um, whether your, your daughters are going to be assaulted, at some point security – uh, for many people, it's going to trump freedom, especially when those freedoms are really seen as sort of bourgeois affectations in the cities when so many Afghans live their lives outside of uh, urban areas. An anxious time for those who live in Agoncillo, a municipality about 120 kilometers south of Manila. They only have a few hours to secure their belongings and move to a safer area. The nearby Ta'al volcano spewed black plumes on Thursday afternoon, a situation people here are all too familiar with. We also don't feel too safe in evacuation centers, so we'll stay with our relatives. Early last year, Ta'al volcano erupted and displaced more than 100,000 people. It was soon followed by the coronavirus pandemic, and the months-long lockdown made it nearly impossible for people who are dependent on fishing and tourism to earn a living. The town of Larel is where hundreds of people went. Imelda Reyes says it hurts to see her children suffer this way. <laughs> I don't really know what to say anymore. I'm just praying. It's a really difficult situation. Across the hall, Marilyn Calapatia is afraid for her children too. Is it the volcano? Is it getting sick? Getting COVID? It's really hard. I have so many children. I can't sleep just thinking about it. But these families are reluctant to leave their homes. They fear the volcano, but they also say they're worried about possible outbreaks of COVID-19 in the evacuation centers. This is why the Philippine government is setting up as many evacuation centers as possible in order to implement the minimum health protocols here. 
Behind me, just a few nautical miles away, is the crater of Ta'al Volcano. And although it seems relatively peaceful here now, people are still afraid. That is because many areas here, even the capital Manila a few hours away, have been blanketed by smog. In fact, based on the latest government data, Ta'al Volcano emitted a record high amount of sulfur dioxide. Those who have lived around the lake all their lives say life before the pandemic and the volcano's eruption was peaceful and their harvests abundant. That feels like a long time ago now. Jamela Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Ta'al, Batangas Province, Northern Philippines. The tale of this military aircraft is almost all that remains after its crash landing. The nearly 100 people on board were mostly recent army graduates. Somehow more than half of them survived and are now in hospital, but many others have lost their lives. Per eyewitnesses, a number of soldiers were seen jumping out of the aircraft before it hit the ground, sparing them from the explosion caused by the crash. The plane was transporting troops from the city of Cagayan de Oro for deployment in Sulu province. It was heading for Jolo City Airport, but appears to have missed and crashed in the vicinity of Bankal village nearby. The armed forces are treating it as an accident rather than an attack. The Jolo runway is shorter than most in the country, making it difficult for pilots to adjust if they miss the landing spot. The Lockheed C-130 Hercules was one of two former United States aircraft sent to the Philippines this year for military assistance. The Philippine government has been battling an insurgency in Sulu for decades. This is a reminder of how cyber attacks can affect our everyday lives. Across Sweden, hundreds of stores belonging to the co-op chain forced to close after a ransomware attack left them unable to operate their cash registers. Extraordinary händelser som inte ska ske, så vi måste gå till botten med hur vi kan hantera det framöver. Prognosen är att vi kommer lösa det, men vi vet fortfarande hur lång tid det tar. Hackers appear to have targeted a US IT firm called Kaseya with massive knock-on effects for its customers. According to cybersecurity experts, criminals hacked into a specific piece of software used by dozens of businesses. The attack left at least 200 US companies affected. This is only the latest in a series of cyber attacks that have destabilized businesses with the aim of wobbling the US economy. Barely two months ago, supplies of gasoline up and down the US East Coast were disrupted when cyber criminals hacked into Colonial Pipeline. Weeks later, Brazilian meat supplier JBS, which has a large US presence, was also targeted by ransomware. Officials believe that Russia-based hackers are behind some of these attacks. But for now, Joe Biden isn't blaming anyone in particular for this hack. The fact is that uh, a director of the intelligence community gave me a, a deep dive on what's happened. And I'll know better uh, tomorrow. And if it is, uh, either with the knowledge of and or a consequence of Russia, then I told Putin we will respond. More and more companies are being forced to pay ransoms as hacks grow even more sophisticated. But sometimes governments can get the upper hand. Washington was able to recover $2.3 million worth of Bitcoin ransom paid to Colonial Pipeline hackers after investigators tracked and seized the virtual currency on the dark web. It's the first time a former South African leader is facing jail time. Jacob Zuma has been ordered to surrender himself to police within five days. He was sentenced to 15 months for failing to appear at a corruption inquiry. The constitutional court judge's decision leaves the former president with few legal options. And the extent to which Mr. Zuma has attempted to justify his defiance through public statements is of no relevance. The statements were not formally pleaded, so fall to be disregarded. The Constitutional Court can do nothing but conclude that Mr. Zuma is guilty of the crime of contempt of court. Zuma resigned from office in 2018 after his own party threatened to pass a vote of no confidence against him for allegations of high-level financial corruption and graft during his time as president. He's always maintained his innocence, but has not cooperated with investigators. May I ask you then as to how you plead to the charges that have been put to you? I plead not guilty. Allegations against Zuma include many titans of industry, whom he is said to have allowed to plunder state resources and influence state policy. The former president maintains he's the target of a political campaign, 
But the Constitutional Court has described his defense and attempt to garner public support as insulting to the people of South Africa. Years of corruption scandals have left South Africa's new leaders with the unenviable task of restoring investor confidence in Africa's most industrialized economy. Famida Miller, Al Jazeera, Johannesburg. Carl Niehaus, uh, because we've heard some strong statements, particularly from one of Jacob Zuma's sons. Uh, what will the war veterans do if he is arrested? You must look at the statement that the war veterans issued. We said that we will oppose President Zuma's arrest and imprisonment, but we will do so within the confines of the law. So we will not act in an illegal manner. We will also respect President Zuma's principled position, where he had stated that he's prepared to go to jail for this principle that he had spelled out in many lengthy documents, that he believes that his fundamental constitutional rights have been undermined. So we will register our opposition. We will resist President Zuma's imprisonment, but we will also respect his principal position, that he is indeed on the basis of his convictions and his belief that his constitutional rights have been undermined, prepared to go to prison in order also to show how strongly he feels about this. Triumphant, Xi Jinping declared China's Communist Party had achieved its goal of its first 100 years and was well on its way to achieving its next. We are now marching confidently toward making China into a great modern socialist power in all respects. The impeccably choreographed ceremony with a massive crowd of party loyalists not only served to show China's might on the world stage, but that of its ruler. Xi's quest for power is now a well-known legend. Born into an elite political family, he saw his fortunes turn south as a small child when his father fell out of favor with Mao Zedong's regime. Cast out to the countryside for hard labor, the young man persevered and eventually made his way into the Communist Party. As a senior provincial official, he became known for his tough stance against corruption before taking up the top position in Shanghai, China's economic capital. Since becoming president in 2012, Xi has steadily increased his grip on power, consolidating it in 2018, when he had his political ideas, the Xi Jinping thought, inscribed into the party's constitution. With the 92 million member Communist Party firmly under control, Xi has become increasingly bold on the world stage. He has taken a hard line on security issues, including territorial disputes with its neighbors and engaged in a trade battle with the United States. Beijing has cracked down hard on freedoms in Hong Kong while rejecting outside criticism. The Chinese people will never allow any foreign forces to bully, oppress or enslave them. The 2018 reform also removed China's two-term limit on the presidency. This means Xi, now 68, can remain in power for life. A procession honoring fallen soldiers. This year, tens of thousands have climbed the steps of this memorial in Jingangshan in southern China. The town is called the Cradle of the Revolution and was where Chinese Communist Party founder Mao Zedong escaped opposition Kuomintang forces and expanded his embattled Red Army. In the lead-up to the party's 100-year anniversary, visitors have come to pay their respects to Mao and his comrades. I'm here because I love the motherland. I love the Communist Party. I've witnessed our country develop and become stronger. The Chinese Communist Party was founded in 1921 with only a few dozen members. Today, there are more than 90 million. The body has ruled China unopposed since 1949. And from the bottom to the top, all are affirming their loyalty to the party ahead of July the 1st. President Xi Jinping has called on all sectors of society to promote the party's history and ideology in the lead up to the celebration. The communists not only helped China to rise up and the Chinese people to become strong 
and proper, prosperous eventually, but they also instilled a nation building and national awareness in the minds of the Chinese people. They realized that the Chinese people are no longer weak or enfeebled. For months, this has been reflected in everything from Communist Party trivia game shows to television dramas. Under President Xi Jinping, the Communist Party has combined Marxism with capitalism.